Here we go, Abby. Question number five. Entropy. First, I thought maybe I should define it. It's a measure of the randomness or disorder of molecules. And we use the abbreviation S, and I'm sure there's a very valid reason. I've just never taken the time to look it up. See, entropy happens spontaneously. Organization requires energy, and it makes perfect sense because if you think about your room, each item in your room theoretically should only have one place you call home, but it has a gazillion places where it could be out of place, but only one place where it belongs. So organization requires a lot more energy than disorder. So next time Julie gives you grief about your room being a mess, you can tell her the universe favors entropy. And it all has to do with probability. So the second law of thermo thermodynamics sorry, says higher entropy is always favored. Disorder is better than order. And the reason has to do with probability. There's more than one way for things to be out of place, but only one way for things to be in place. And nature spontaneously moves towards the state with the highest probability. For example, we know that rust, it just happens. So clearly the act of rusting is at a higher probability state or it wouldn't rust all on its own. So taking a look at probability, what are the possible position these two atoms can be in? Well, right now, I'd call that one position. They're on the left side. Then we have another option. There's one option where they could be on that side. There's only one possibility for the two atoms to be on the left, and there's only one possibility for the two atoms to be on the right. So the chances of that happening are pretty slim, but what about the possibilities for there to be one atom on each side? You could have it like that. There's two possibilities. So this is much more likely to happen. And the probability of something happening depends on the number of ways that you can get there. The more molecules, the more this becomes. See, once we get to, you know, Avogadro's number, the, 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 the possibilities are endless. This is just a nice visual showing the, the microstates. And if you can imagine four, then maybe eight, then maybe 20, then Avogadro's number, good luck with that. But we can imagine one arrangement where these four atoms are on the left. We could imagine that there's all of these arrangements where A, B, C, or D are on the right and the rest of them are on the left. And then if we picture two of them on either side, well, that's the most likely arrangement because there's more positional probability for two of them, no, it doesn't matter which two, to be on either side. So what's the driving force behind this spontaneous process? Well, the reason for it is positional probability. And that's the idea behind entropy. So you know that if we open the stopcock here, the balls aren't going to move all the way over there. No, we know that's not going to happen. We would have to actually add energy to the system to get that to happen. It's just, it's just not going to happen that way. So which has greater entropy, solid, liquid, or gaseous water? And the answer is? the liquid water. It has more positional entropy. However, this does depend on temperature a little bit because in the Arctic, when the temperature is really low, the solid's actually favored, but don't worry about that. It's This is it, normal temperatures, hydrogen bonding at work again. And usually the bigger the volume, the bigger the positional probability. So yeah, the big one. 
A solid tends to have less entropy. A solution has more. So that's kind of why things dissolve. Yeah, entropy. Now, in any spontaneous process, there's always an increase in the entropy of the universe. The second law says entropy is constantly increasing. So which of the following pairs is most likely to have positional energy? Solid or gaseous phosphorus? Well, that would be gaseous phosphorus because in a gas, there's much, 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 many more, many more, yeah, that's awesome grammar positions for the atoms to be in than in a solid. Now, for this, which is going to have more positional entropy? Methane or butane? Well, in this case, it's going to be the butane because this one has so many more single bonds that there's much more likely for those positions to be different. Whereas in methane, just that carbon is going to be connected to four hydrogens. Enough said. So now you're looking at solid or liquid? Yeah, it's definitely going to be the liquid. The liquid's always going to have larger um, positional probability. This one does hydrogen bonding, so while the difference is slight, it's still there. Now we can get to your problem. Without doing any calculations, determine the sign of the entropy. The easiest way to do this without giving any other information is to look at the change in volume. And we know that the change in volume is directly proportional to the change in the number of moles. And remember before, we said the greater the volume, the greater the entropy. So here we go from 2 plus 1, that's 3 moles on the reactant side, 2 moles. So this wouldn't be very likely to happen spontaneously to go from 3 moles to 2 moles. So we are, in a sense, decreasing the volume. So we're decreasing the entropy. So this would have a sign of negative. Now on this one, we go from 2 moles to 3 moles. Well, if we increase the moles, we increase the volume. Thus, we increase the entropy, and we give it a sign of plus. On this one, we go from 2 plus 1, 1, that's 3 moles, down to 2 moles. Again, we have decreased the number of moles. So then we've decreased the volume, which means we've decreased the entropy, negative. This one's tricky. Because we're looking at volume in moles, I don't care about this solid. So we've gone from 1 mole to 1 mole which means the change in entropy is zero. Now, another way we can predict spontaneous processes, but none, you don't really care about that. We just care about G right now. We're gonna use this equation for the next several problems. But remember that this equation depends on the system. Okay, without doing calculations, determine the sign of G. So notice, that as the temperature approaches zero, that means that the free energy available to this system is going to depend on, I'm gonna get my pen back, hold on. It's gonna depend on the change in enthalpy of the system times zero. And I'm going to say zero because, remember, we said low temperatures. So we're assuming that temperature is approaching zero. So this part of the equation drops out. Yeah, I know, it's a good x. Which means then our energy is going to be approximately the same as the enthalpy of the system. In this case, the enthalpy is negative. So for low temperatures, G is going to be the same as the enthalpy, negative. Try this one. Remember, it's going to be about the same as the enthalpy, so the sign on G, positive. 
at low temperatures. For this one, I bet you can get it. I bet you got this. Yeah, it's negative. You got this one. Bet you do. No, yeah, ding. Yep, it's positive. And now, high temperatures, that's the key. Taking a look at this one, we're just going to assume that temperature is going to approach infinity. That's about as high temperature as we can get. So in this particular scenario, we're going to say the Gibbs free energy times the enthalpy minus infinity and beyond, no, it can help it, um, times the entropy. Well, this number is pretty big. So any number multiplied by infinity is going to be huge. So this value won't even count because our free energy then is going to be equal to a really bitty tiny number relative to anything times infinity. So because this number is so small, we can ignore it and say that delta G is going to be about the same as the entropy and our signs then are going to be the same as that of entropy for high temperatures. Don't care about delta H since delta S is negative, delta G is negative. And I bet you can do this one. Don't care about that. Entropy is positive, so G is, yeah, positive. Don't care, entropy is S, so G is, yes, you guessed it, negative. Since S is zero, G is going to be zero. So in sum, entropy dominates at high temperatures, enthalpy dominates at low temperatures. This one's the tricky one, determining the sign of G at any temperature, because we know entropy depends on temperature. Well, so we have to think about the signs for a minute. Take the starting equation, and we know that this is exothermic, so we know it's going to be releasing heat energy. If it's releasing heat energy, that means the temperature is going to go up. But the question is, how much? If the temperature goes up a whole lot, then this term wins. But if it doesn't go up a whole lot, then this term wins. So there's the problem. Which term wins? There's really no way to tell. It totally depends on temperature. So G is going to be positive or negative. Take a look at this one. We know it's endothermic and if it's endothermic, that means the temperature is going to decrease. Well, if the temperature decreases, so here we have the temperature going down, so which term is going to matter more? If the temperature goes down a lot, then this term wins. If the temperature doesn't go down enough, this term wins. So which is it? Well, you can't tell. It depends on the temperature. So G could be plus or minus. Again, same problem we had with the very first term. We have a, a reaction that's endothermic, or I lied, sorry, exothermic, negative entropy. It's going to depend on the temperature. We can't tell. It's positive or negative. Finally, we get one that's reasonable. If we think about the signs, delta S is zero. So we can write anything times zero, zero. That whole term is zero. So then our value on G is going to be the same as H. And since that's endothermic, well, delta G is going to be negative. I mean, positive. Yeah, mm. said the wrong thing. Endothermic, that's, um, yeah, positive. So delta G, yeah, that's positive. Oh, what a day. Okay, well, that should do it for this problem, and then I'll see what I can do for another.